The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Today we'll talk about asymmetric tops. And I discovered that there are a lot of mistakes that still exist in these notes, and I'll try to correct them. Um, a lot of the material that I, in these lectures comes from this book by Towns and Shallow. I have a four book rule that there's certain books which are sufficiently important that you have to have four copies. One for the office, one for the lab, one for the bathroom, and one for your bed. <laughs> and Townsend Shallow is definitely one of the, is a four booker. Uh, there are a few others that have to be a four, a four book uh, uh, class, uh, like Tinkham used to be for me, uh, and, and certainly Hertzberg's Diatomics. But uh, this is by far and away the most important book you could have in your library, I think. Now, well, other than, uh, that's, that's up for you, that's, that you can decide. Uh, but, uh, three and two as well, absolutely, and there's, there's, there, there are uh, negative ones. I mean, books that you have to have but you don't want. And, uh, <laughs> what, what was the last place of the four books? Yeah. Office, lab, bathroom, and bed. bed. Okay. You know, you got to have something yeah. under your yeah. pillow. Yeah. Okay. So, I, it's been a long time since I've assigned a problem, and so I have one today. And this is a kind of a classic problem. And we're just about at the point where, we, where you can do this one. And it also uh, helps to ameliorate some of the incredible stupidity I did last lecture. Okay, consider the molecule SF4. SF4 was a classic molecule uh, in uh, testing qualitative ideas of molecular structure. Um, and in fact, there is a, there is a paper uh, by John Waugh in which he uh, puts his uh, decisive two cents in to deciding the structure. So what I want you to do, now the, some of you have had a connection with 5.11, 1 or 2 and Vesper is taught or used to be taught. Is Vesper taught in 5.11.1 or 5.11.2? Well, if you use valence shell electron pair repulsion, you can predict the correct qualitative structure of SF4. So what I want you to do is to calculate the microwave spectrum for J, so for all transitions with J equal to or smaller than 4, in other words 4 to 3 and um, assuming uh, tetrahedral structure, uh, um, that's easy, right? I, I mean, I, I didn't want to say it, but uh, um, the D3H structure, uh, D3H is a symmetry point group, it, it's analogous to ammonia except it's got an extra fluorine. And the teeter-totter structure, which is... That's the technical term for it. What? The technical term is seesaw, but whatever. Oh, seesaw, okay, right. So you have two, uh, a base of one uh, SF2, and then the two others with longer bonds and nearly linear. That's the correct structure. And uh, so, uh, if you calculate the microwave specter for these three species, you uh, will get a sense of how you could use microwave spectroscopy to decide what is the structure of SF4. Now, 
what, you, what I want you to do is to make reasonable guesses for bond lengths. Um, and I don't care what reasonable guesses you use, one, one thing you could do is uh, take the bond length, the SF bond length from SF6. Uh, um, but, or you could just guess a reasonable bond length uh, based on uh, information in the old chemical rubber tables where they gave the radii, the covalent radii of atoms. But whatever, however you decide, I want you to calculate the structure. I actually used to give an exam where I would give the microwave spectrum and you would have to uh, deduce, assign it and deduce a structure. Okay, and so the main reason for giving such a problem is when you're faced with the microwave spectrum, you start out by assuming a geometry, locating the center mass, and then uh, either by inspection, figuring out which are the A, B, and C axes, or you just write the inertial tensor and diagonalize it. And I, I guarantee you that for the teeter-totter geometry or the seesaw geometry, whatever you want to call it, uh, uh, you're not going to find, uh, well, that's actually not true. Um, there's enough symmetry that you, that you can simplify the problem so that at least you don't have to diagonalize a three by three. So that's a problem. And let's have that uh, done a, a week from Friday. Okay. So, we want to set up the effective Hamiltonian or the Hamiltonian for an asymmetric top. And uh, uh, we, know, we, we start out by knowing uh, the um, the way to set up the uh, rotational Hamiltonian for a symmetric top. And uh, so let's just review some of that. We have something here which we will just call J. Uh, now this strictly isn't J. It's J minus orbital angular momentum minus spin minus vibrational angular momentum. And this is, uh, so th this is basically the nuclear rotation excluding vibration. And there is this wonderful classic paper by Watson. Uh, Nineteen sixty-eight. I was a graduate student then, uh, and this this is really the rotational Hamiltonian. Uh, it's also called the Watsonian. It's so important that instead of be calling calling it a Hamiltonian, it's called a Watsonian, uh, and that's really a tribute of your from your colleagues to have something named after you. Okay. So anyway, we want this thing. And uh, if you can find the uh, coordinate system which, in which the inertial tensor is diagonal, then you can write the Hamiltonian as like this. So we have three rotational constants. Now by definition, the moments of inertia, IA, IB, and IC, are, this is the light one, and so the rotational constants in this order. Now this is actually quite important 
because the masses, the moments of inertia, are something that are absolutely knowable. And uh, we're going to be observing small splittings when we start dealing with asymmetric tops. And these small splittings, asymmetry doublings, have a sign. And that sign is determined by the inertias, the moments of inertia, and the symmetry. And so uh, if you have, in an electronic transition, knowing th the moments of inertia and uh, the energy order of two asymmetry split levels, you can often determine the rotation, the electronic vibrational symmetry of a state, and that's actually a really important thing. It's one of those uh, invariant things that you can, you can use. It's not an accident. You know, often when you have small doublings, it's due to an accident. It's due to second order effects. This is not. This is, this is really uh, something you can depend on, and it's uh, neglected. Okay, so now, these moments of inertia, despite what is written in the notes, is the, are the sum of the masses times the square of the perpendicular distance from the appropriate axis. And so uh, if we were to look at a, a molecule like this um, and uh, first of all, for that shape, uh, this uh, is cispent acetylene, in case you didn't, uh, didn't know. It, it's in the C2V point group, but now we have, we have three different ways of labeling axes. We have A, B, and C. We have X, Y, and Z based on symmetry. And we have Z based on near symmetry. And uh, it's, it's really, uh, it's, it's very confusing. And, and sometimes when you have two different forms of the two molecules, these are both C2V molecules. The near symmetry axis is, is this and that. What exactly is meant by near symmetry? Well, these are both prolate tops. And the prolate axis is the near symmetry axis. It's the, uh, it's the A axis. And, uh, but from a group theoretical point of view, that's the Z axis. This is the Z axis. So we have the Z axis determined two different ways. And then we have a, B, and C, which are determined by moments of inertia. Okay, so there's, there's a lot of hidden complexity in, in this. Okay, now, uh, one of the things that you want to be able to do is to, to develop some intuition for how do A, B, and C change as the molecule is distorted through various normal mode vibrations. Okay, and because one of the things that you often use to make vibrational assignments, now I, I'm talking about normal modes, we haven't done normal modes in this class, but everybody knows what a vibration is and has some ideas about normal modes. So how the A, B, and C rotational constants change with vibrational excitation, or how they are different from those in the ground vibrational state, provide a clue as to the vibrational nature of the state. And so you don't need to have all the machinery of uh, uh, writing down the center of mass coordinate system and going to the uh, uh, coordinate system where the inertial tensor is diagonal. You can do a lot of that stuff in your heads. And you should practice that. And there are some wonderful things. I mean, suppose we start, okay, so, uh, for this molecule, I've already told you the A axis is, is like this because 
this axis puts the heavy atoms close to the axis and all the atoms as close to the axis as possible. And you want the smallest moment of inertia. And so then there's the question, is this B or uh, is this the B axis or the C axis? The center, uh, the center of mass is somewhere about there. Uh, and so is this C or is that C? Okay, and so if we have an axis here, the perpendicular distances of, uh, well, we can look, uh, basically if you, you uh, if you look only at the heavy atoms, then you can see that the heavy atoms are farther from the, the, the perpendicular to that, the, this axis is longer to the heavy atoms than from here. And so that already gives you some guidance. If you have a, a longer distance, the moment of inertia is larger, and that's that makes it the C axis. So, um, is it always true for planar molecules that the c-axis is up here? Yes. Okay. And so is that something that you've heard, memorized, or thought through? I mean, it, I, I mean. That I had heard it before and I was trying to remember. Yeah, I mean, most people have heard that. It's familiar and it's, it's an easy fact to remember. If you've got a planar molecule, the c-axis is perpendicular to the plane. Uh, and, uh, but you ought to convince yourself that it's true. It's not too hard. Okay, one of the things that, uh, that I like to challenge you with is suppose you start with a molecule that's planar and you, tor and you do a torsion. Well, what's going to happen is that the B and C axes, the, the B and C moments of inertia. So as you do a torsion, uh, uh, away from the cis-bent geometry, uh, the, uh, the symmetry axis doesn't move. You still have a C2 axis, and, but as you do this torsion, the B and C axes switch roles. You get an accidental symmetric top at some angle, which is something that the acetylene people have experienced. and. Uh, you can also do that for starting from the, the transbent geometry. And so there's the, the interesting question. If, suppose you have a vibration which at, uh, has large enough amplitude that at one turning point, uh, the, uh, 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 the B and C axes have one orientation, and at the other uh, turning point, the B and C axes have switched roles. And, uh, Surely there's going to be complexity there. Then there's the issue of, in order to describe rotation, we think about the molecules being rigid. And we solve this problem and we find the special coordinate system where the inertial tensor is diagonal. Well, what happens when the molecule vibrates? Is the inertial tensor going to stay diagonal? What do we mean by the body fixed coordinate system? Do we, uh, I mean, we establish this special coordinate system by, uh, with re by, by saying, okay, the atoms have definite locations. But what if they're moving? Are we, are we going to uh, establish a coordinate system which is based on where they were when they started, or are you going to follow? And if the atoms move, do you, keep the, do you define a coordinate system where the inertial tensor is always diagonal? If that's true, then the coordinate system is going to be doing that, which is non-inertial, which leads to all sorts of problems. Now, you can do whatever you want, but you have to be honest. You can't, you know, if you've created a problem, you're going to have to use your basis functions to solve the problem later. But it is, as soon as you go away from diatomic molecules, you really have to understand the physics. You have to be able to understand all of the, the subtle effects. And one of the things that's so tempting to do 
when we're dealing with matrix mechanics is to pretend that we understand everything. And so you have to be careful. But okay, so we're going to talk about asymmetric tops starting from what we know about symmetric tops. And Sam asked a question at the end of the last lecture which led me to draw a correlation diagram on the board and that's really where we want to start. Um, so, uh, so we have a prolate and oblate and uh, uh, I did this for j equals 2. So let's do it again for j equals 2. And so we have a level here and we have a level here. And in the prolate top, we had uh, the, well, the energy levels go as B or J, J plus 1 plus uh, a quantity A minus b a squared. And over here it's b jj plus 1 pl plus uh, c minus b k squared. This is negative, this is positive. And so we had energy levels like this and like that. This is positive and large, this is negative and small. Now uh, you can have positive and negative k's and so these levels, so 0, 1, 2, these are doubled and 0, 1, and 2. The doubling is, is in the symmetric top, this is a parity doubling. Parity is something that commutes with uh, the full Hamiltonian, but it also commutes with the rotational Hamiltonian. It doesn't matter what the shape of the molecule is, it doesn't matter whether it's a symmetric top or an asymmetric top. Uh, you can show that there's going to be uh, a good quantum number called parity. It comes from sigma v and uh, so, but now we have a non-crossing rule. And so we start with the unique level which we, uh, we could call it positive parity but it doesn't really matter. The unique level correlates to one of these k equals 2 levels. These two levels are degenerate. The level here has a definite parity. It joins up with a level of its same parity. The other parity level correlates with this. And, and so no assumptions are being made. Now, uh, and and we, just, we just continue connecting levels until we run out of levels and you might as well draw straight lines. Now we have a Hamiltonian that will tell us what, the, what the, the form will be but it's reasonable to expect that as you break the symmetry you're not going to get some kind of a crazy behavior uh, where the, the, these levels of opposite parity will cross. That's legal. But levels of the same parity can't cross. And so it's reasonable to expect that this correlation diagram with straight lines across from these two qualitatively different patterns will give uh, a good idea of what do the energy levels look like as you get starting to go away from symmetric top limit. And so a huge amount of insight can be obtained by simp simply drawing these vertical lines. Now, what you'd really like is some way of being quantitative about where you are between 
the prolate limit or the oblate limit. And we're going to talk about that. And the, there's no reason to re rely on this diagram when you could simply calculate everything. However, a huge amount of qualitative insight is obtained from this diagram. And in fact, we label states according to this diagram. So we, we label energy levels um, now in Townsend Shallow's book instead of Ka, Kc it was K minus 1, K1. The reason for that is this suggests that J, we're, these are the projections of J on the A-axis and on the C-axis, which is only half correct. What you'll discover, well, what you can see is um, when you make this correlation between, you know, you have a near prolate top, uh, you have definite Ka's. Those are, in fact, the projection of J on the inertial axes. And you have two levels of the same Ka, and they correlate to levels of different Kc. That's just a label. Why only two? Well, it's only two because it's not really a projection on the C-axis, it's just the two possible states that K, a uh, particular value of Ka can correlate to. So Townsend Shallow used this kind of neutral notation to avoid suggesting something that wasn't completely true. And there's another notation, tau. Tau goes from minus J to plus J. There are two J plus one possible values of tau. This is also something that's absolutely true. It's the energy rank. You have this diagram, you count up from the bottom. And, and so any particular molecule, you can label levels without any ambiguity, just saying this is the lowest and this is the highest. And you know how many possible levels there are. And so if I give you a, a state four minus two, you know pretty much where that is in the level diagram. It's much nicer to know 4 minus 2 in terms of Ka, Kc labels. Okay, so there's all of these different labels and almost everyone uses this notation. But this K, J tau notation is a really good notation too. And you want to be careful. If you're near the prolate limit, uh, the first index is a good measure of the projection on the near symmetry axis. If you're near the oblate limit, the second index is really a projection quantum over, and the other is just a label. Now, studying of this, you discover that Ka plus Kc can be equal to J or J plus 1. Those are the only two possible values for Ka plus Kc. And you can also convince yourself whether uh, this one or this one is always higher. Okay, and uh, uh, the higher one, the, the higher energy level, let's say for this, goes to the lower value of Kc. So that means that the higher of the, uh, the higher of the two asymmetry components is always the one where Ka plus Kc sums to J. The lower one is always J plus 1. 
There are other qualitative things that you can get from this. You can, uh, if, if this diagram were drawn uh, reasonably correctly, you would be able to see that the splitting uh, in, uh, well, you, you would see that the splitting in low K levels is larger than the splitting in high K levels, despite what the spastic did up here. Okay, and why is that? Because the higher K levels are connecting to Ks that, are, uh, that have smaller splittings over here. So there's a huge amount you get from this diagram and from this labeling system. And, you know, I, I'm spending a lot of time doing, you know, really simple-minded stuff, but it's really important to realize how beautiful and powerful just the notation is. Barrett. Uh, why did you say that the Awfully levels are closer together? Because A is bigger than B, bigger than C, and so uh, the prolate, you have the big thing minus a, a medium sized thing. Oh, so if one is big, then the other is small. That's right. Okay. So. Um, it's just because of the signs. It's, well, there's a sign. Both of them have a difference, but, you know, one is up like this and the other is like that, but, but also th there's one like this and one like that. Okay, so... Uh, if it was really bad, they could be the same. You could, you know, you could cook up a, a situation where, but it's generally true that A, a is much bigger than B, uh, and... Uh, uh, in an absolute sense, and for the same percentage difference, the difference between B and C would be really small in an absolute sense. And that's the way it works. Okay, um, so what else did I want to say about that? Let's begin again and derive the Hamiltonian for an asymmetric top, uh, starting from having uh, gotten to the diagonal representation. So we have the rotation is given by jx squared over 2ix plus jy squared over 2iy plus jz squared over 2iz. And so we know always jz squared on jkm is going to be h bar squared uh, k squared jkm and j squared, we know what j squared does, we know what j plus minus to do. And the only uh, caution is j plus is a lowering operator and j minus is a raising operator because this is uh, this, this is a raising and lowering operator in the rotating frame, and you always reverse the sense. And okay, so we need to do a little bit of uh, algebra. So jx, uh, well, we well we define raising and lowering operators, and. Uh, uh, and so we can write Jx as one half J plus plus J minus. And we can define Jy as minus uh, I over 2 times J plus minus J minus. That's true. All of that's true. Okay. So now what we'd like to do is use these uh, relationships between uh, Cartesian components and raising and lowering components to calculate the terms that go in here. So Jx squared is going to be one fourth J plus squared plus J minus squared plus uh, J plus J minus plus J minus J plus. And 
and j y squared is going to be minus one fourth j plus squared plus j minus squared plus j plus okay where is it uh, minus there we go minus j plus j minus minus j minus j plus okay so um, we're going to take advantage of the fact that we have jx squared and jy squared having off diagonal terms that have exactly the same form and having uh, um, having these terms which have opposite signs. Let's see if I got that right. Where did I do this? Okay, we do a little we do a little bit more algebra though. J plus, J minus, plus J minus, J plus. If we, if we multiply that out, we discover uh, that uh, uh, this is 2JX squared plus JY squared, which is just 2J uh, squared minus JZ squared. So, we have this, these, these terms turn out to be diagonal. These terms turn out to be off diagonal. And uh, we can start combining things. So what we, uh, what we do, since we have diagonal terms uh, for uh, jx squared and jy squared, that have the same uh, value but opposite sign, we can write the diagonal part of the Hamiltonian where we replace jx squared by 2j uh, squared minus jz squared. And so we multiply by 1 over 2ix. And now the jy squared has the same thing but with a minus sign. And now did I do it wrong? It looks like I did. Why? Uh, what have I done? So we got the Okay, I've got two, I've got some signs reversed. <coughs> These are supposed to have the same sign. All right, let's just go back up here. Okay, jx squared uh, is, uh, so jx is that, so, um, we're going to get jx squared, that's going to be j plus squared and uh, j minus squared and then plus j plus j minus and the other way around. And jy squared is going to give us, um, oh, there it is. Okay, so we had a minus sign out in front and it cancels it. Okay, so we had a minus sign out here because it's I squared. And uh, so that's... So the notes are correct on this 
And then there is also a Jz squared term. Uh, and so we have Jz squared over iz, 2iz. So this is the diagonal part of the uh, uh, rotational Hamiltonian. And then the off-diagonal part of the rotational Hamiltonian, we, uh, we had these terms with j plus squared, j minus squared, so one-fourth uh, and minus a fourth. And so uh, we get one-fourth uh, j plus squared plus j minus squared times uh, one over 2ix plus 1 over 2iy. And now I got the signs reversed. Okay. This is correct. Okay, so diagonal term, we have a sum of uh, rotational constants, and this looks very much like what we had for the symmetric top. It is what we had for the symmetric top. It was derived differently. And here is something new, and these are matrix elements that cause change in k by 2. Now we know, we know what j plus on jkm does, and j plus squared on jkm does that twice. Uh, so we know all the matrix elements, and so we now have the uh, uh, form of the Hamiltonian, and we can write this Hamiltonian in either of two limits, or actually three limits. Um, we, um, the near prolate limit, then what we're doing is we're building our model of how the levels behave based on the, the prolate symmetric top. So we would like to uh, uh, um, describe the perturbation term as something that's small. Uh, and the, so uh, we're going to uh, be interested in B minus C. We're going to call these two rotational constants uh, B and C. There's a difference in rotational constant. We have a one-fourth. And so this is one-fourth times uh, the, these operators, one-fourth times the difference. And here we're going to have uh, the sum of rotational constants. Uh, and these are the same two, B B plus C, and uh, uh, and here's A. So we, we we can see how this is going to be written, and we're going to, what we're going to do is we're going to call this uh, B plus C over two, um, and we're going to multiply that by four. So. The, um, In the Hamiltonian, that first that squared sign should be inside the parentheses, right? Which squared sign? J squared minus J Z. Oh, absolutely. Okay, and uh, so we're going to have um, 1 over 2ix plus 1 over 2iy jj plus 1, and then
so these are the diagonal elements. And so this is uh, um, this is going to be B plus C over 2. We got the, the 2 over here. And this is going to be uh, A minus B plus C over 2. A over 2 minus B plus C over 2. And, uh, and then we have the off-diagonal terms. Now in the, in the oblate limit, instead of having B plus C over 2, we're going to have uh, A plus B over 2. In both cases, we call this B bar. Because we want to close our eyes and think this is like a diatomic molecule or this is like a symmetric top. And so we want the notation to uh, guide us. Okay. And the off diagonal elements uh, will, will be of the form J, K, H rotation, J, K plus or minus 2. And they will be one fourth, uh, in this case, um, for the prolate limit, B minus C, then J, J plus one minus K, K uh, plus or minus one where what? J, J plus 1 minus K plus or minus 1. K plus or minus 2. Or, uh. So again, we, we write these, we start with K, we go from K to K plus or, uh, K plus or minus 1. And then we go from k plus or minus 1 to k plus or minus 2. And we always have in here the product of the initial and final values of k. So, um, okay, so that's, that's the Hamiltonian for an asymmetric top. We, we have the asymmetry, the, 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 the stuff that this new, which is related to the difference in rotational constants. And we have the stuff that's old as the average of the two non, uh, uh, you know, we always distinguish the near symmetry axis, the A from the B and C, so we, we take the average of the two non-special guys, and then we have this, and this looks just like the symmetric top. And so all of the corrections are due to the difference between the two non-special rotational constants. Now. So does that mean that for every uh, asymmetric top molecule, one could imagine some special symmetric top molecule that has the same properties with some particular, you know, arbitrary uh, constants? Well, you can imagine a symmetric top that has the same A and B as A and B bar. Right. Um, so how would that differ? But the energy levels will, uh, you won't have, you'll have, um, you'll have asymmetry splittings, which the symmetric top can't have. And so the, the energy levels won't, resemble each other except for the overall scale. Now, so like the relative differences between the first and second transitions and the second and third transitions? No, between the top and bottom K. I think that uh, yeah. you, have to, you have to find out what's the same between the two. Okay, so now, um, Clearly, we have something that's telling you about the strength 
of the asymmetry and it makes sense to compare the strength of the asymmetry to the differences between the levels that uh, uh, you get from the symmetric top because so the uh, the, diff the k splittings from the symmetric top tell you how the molecule is trying to preserve the symmetric top pattern and then you have this other thing which if it's small doesn't do much if it's large completely destroys the pattern and so how do you decide on uh, uh, how to measure the strength of B minus C relative to A plus B. Well, uh, you, can, you can do perturbation theory and you can say, okay, let's just compare the, the off-diagonal elements, uh, K, J, K, J, K plus or minus 2 to the difference in diagonal elements. And so you do this, and there's a lot of algebra that, that ensues, and you get some function of j and k. And you get a minus c over 2b minus a minus c. So this is universal. This is special to the molecule. This is the strength of the asymmetry. So, uh, and now suppose we say we have a symmetric top. In a symmetric prolate top, B is equal to C. So what does this become? We have, that's the same thing as A minus B, and this is the same thing as B minus A. So, this quantity is minus one. For a symmetric, for an ace, for, a, for a prolate, for an oblate top, A is equal to B. And so if A is equal to B, we can rewrite this as B minus C over uh, um, B minus C. And this is plus one. So this parameter goes from minus one to plus one in the two extreme limits. And it turns out that actually what we use is the reciprocal of that. Kappa uh, is Ray's asymmetry parameter. Who is, who is Ray? He wrote a paper in Z Phys. I haven't looked him up yet. Uh, and he's, uh, his initials are S, uh, what is, where is it? Where is my first paper? <laughs> B.S. Ray. A, he wrote his paper in Zephyrs in 1932, and uh, uh, I'm sure you'll find it. Anyway, so the asymmetry parameter is 2B minus A minus C over A minus C. And so uh, um, when this parameter, so this is. Uh, uh, how big is the off-diagonal matrix element relative to the diagonal matrix element? And so when this is big, it's very asymmetric. So when this reciprocal is near zero, it's very asymmetric. So uh, so we've chosen, we have a parameter that goes between plus one and minus one, and when it's zero as opposed to infinity, which it would be uh, in the most asymmetric limit if this were our, our uh, uh, asymmetry parameter, uh, we have the most asymmetric top. Now, there has been, uh, are we out of time? Yeah, we are. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion. Why is it that asymmetry parameters are always really close to plus one or minus one. There, you know, the vast majority of the asymmetry parameters are between, uh, are larger than 0.9 or smaller than minus 0.9. Almost every molecule is near one, 
limit. And there's a, a paper, I think by Jim Kinsey and Bob Silby on the subject of why are there so many, why is there such a strong preference for near symmetric tops? This isn't just because spectroscopists take spectra of multiple no. fields that are... No, this is actually uh, a mass thing. It turns out that uh, this, the, these are not random variables and that there, there is a good physical reason why most molecules are nearly symmetric or nearly asymmetric, uh, nearly prolate or nearly oblate tops. And so, now, the last thing I want to say is when you use perturbation theory, you generally like to start near the limit that is appropriate. And so, if it's a near prolate top, you use prolate top basis functions and all of the perturbation corrections are small. And if it's a near oblate top, you do the other. But suppose instead you chose something which is always going to be uh, uh, appropriate for either limit. And so, if you choose A as your near symmetry axis, you're in the prolate limit. If you use C as the symmetry axis, you're in the near oblate limit. If you choose B, you've really done a terrible thing, but you have perturbation theory that always is appropriate. It doesn't care which limit. It, the trouble is it blows up. <laughs> what? Probably pretty quickly. Yes, it does. And you can tell just by looking at this, param this, this thing in brackets on the middle of page four, uh, when is that thing um, going to be, uh, sm uh, uh, when is that going to get large compared to one? And you can see that if j is equal to k, well then it won't get large. But anywhere else it will as j gets large. Okay, we better stop. So tomorrow morning we'll talk about transitions. And uh, uh, again, we don't have to do things the way Townsend Shallow did using simple formulas because uh, we can calculate whatever we need. This is really simple, but it's still a very beautiful thing to, to look at the, the intensity distributions and the information you can get from pure rotation spectra of symmetric and asymmetric tops. And so I will give a mixture of old-fashioned and modern stuff for this. Okay. <laughs>